Hello, this is Scott with Hilux Optics. Hey, this is Chris with Hilux Optics. What you are about to witness is the actual load development testing on a factory standard M1A. What's that loadout? So today we're going to be developing a load for the Springfield M1A. This is the loaded model and uh, we're shooting a 150 grain boat tail Sierra bullet. And uh, we worked up a charge weight test starting from 41 grains of 4064 up to 43.3 grains or 43.7 grains, excuse me. And uh, today we're just going to be finding out what charge weight will get us the velocity that we need. Stay tuned. Oh, wow. Okay, I see. Well, it wasn't quite as tight of a set of groups as I would have liked, but we did learn a few important things. Yeah, uh, we got, I'd say it was a, overall a very successful day. We got a lot of good information to go off of. So um, referring to the trusty data book right here. So starting off with our first group at 41.3 grains, actually all the way up to the top group of uh, our top charge weight of uh, 43.7 grains. We've noticed um, a lot of horizontal stringing for our groups. Now we, we did keep the, the overall length of the, of the bullet the same across all the groups just to keep that uh, variable consistent and which was at 2.8 um, inches. So two inches, 800 thousandths. And that's measured off the nose? That is measured off the nose. So measuring off the nose is not the most consistent way to do it, but um, I just wanted to get something uh, get, we just wanted to have a starting point. So I'm thinking that this rifle probably doesn't like that 2.8 inch overall length. Um, I think there's also something to be said for the fact that this is not a free floating barrel. This hasn't been modified, bedded. Mm -hmm. We haven't even checked the tension on any of the lugging components. I think that we are just not making proper use of the harmonics that this rifle might be capable of. Mm -hmm. Again, not as perfectly as a free-floating bolt action, all the bells and whistles, but I think we could probably squeeze our groups down to about half of what they were. Yeah, and this is part of the fun. So I'd say probably our worst group was about five and a half, six minutes. Yeah. A lot of it, um, the vertical, there wasn't too much vertical string. I'd say we were pretty, pretty tight for elevation, but... Some of the horizontal spreads were about six inches at the worst. Our best groups did get us down to about two minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll have to bring it into the shop and uh, take a closer look to get you an exact number, but I'd say they're pretty close to two MOA, which might be the, 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 factory, the accuracy out of the factory for this rifle. 
But um, I, I'd say we found two nodes specifically that we can do some more uh, seeding depth testing to go off of. So we, we have one at 42.2 grains of 4064. That got us about 2579 feet per second with a SD of 11. And then the higher node that we found was 43.4 and 43.7 grains. Uh, that got us around 2647 and 2673 feet per second, respectively, with uh, SDs of 3.8 and 5.9. So those numbers were very promising. We, we weren't too strict with sorting our brass or even weighing our bullets, but just off of the initial charge weight test, I think we have some good information to go off of. Uh, what kind of brass were we using? We were using PPU brass. Uh, this was um, once fired out of a out of our POF rifle, and uh, we full length sized it, and also ran it through the small base sizing die. Now I, you tend to trim the neck too, and everything. Yeah. So if you watch um, in our previous video when we did the lo reloading at the at the shop, um, I trimmed everything to the maximum Sammy recommended length, which is about two inches and 15 thousandths. And that way we, we just know that the length of the brass is consistent across all the reloads. And yeah. I mean, the brass, we've kept everything together in pretty good batches. So they all been fired the same number of times in the mm -hmm. same rifles and the same, same loads. lots. Um, but we did notice when I, when I did um, hand select a couple pieces of brass just to weigh them, I did notice there was probably a deviation of about three grains from the lightest to the heaviest. So that, that could play a factor, but I, I think um, what's more, um, what's more uh, important actually, we're more, more of a factor is this, the seating depth. So I think the next test we'll, we'll, we'll be running on this is uh, doing another seating depth test, but this time we'll focus on uh, the two nodes. So we'll, we'll go, we'll do maybe five uh, different lengths with 42.2 grains of 4064, and we'll do five different lengths with uh, 43.4 grains of 4064. 40, and uh, this time we'll load all the way, uh, starting from touching the lands, and we'll go back maybe in 15 thousandths increments. And we'll do five different loads varying the, the uh, seating depth. And we'll be doing this a little bit sloppy. The plan is to seat the bullet in the neck of the case fairly light, just a tiny bit of tension. Let the bolt close it down until it's just as long as it can possibly be and still fit mm -hmm. and start backing off from there. That way we know it's touching and we don't have to measure off the nose. It'll be measure off of where the O-drive of the bullet is touching the edge of the throat. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our criteria too, um, we don't want to, uh, to seat the bullets too long. We want it to fit in our magazine just for practicality purposes. So we'll see uh, uh, what's the max length that we can fit in our magazine and obviously um, whatever that'll definitely take a higher uh press or priority when we do our final um selection of uh the charge weight and the seating depth now chris is of a mind that the seating depth is going to play the biggest factor in what is going to determine our actual precision out of this rifle i'm a fan of thinking that possibly the harmonics were larger at play here but after all of this after we get everything dialed in and see what the most precise possible load seating depth everything else we're going to send this off to Fulton Armory to have it really tuned up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have them work on the trigger, change out to a national match barrel, and we'll see if they'll glass bed this for us. And then after that, we'll have to start all over, which is not really a problem because, you know, it gives us more opportunity to shoot. Mm -hmm. Not exactly a bad thing. And I'm, I'm also curious to see if uh, we find a good load with this, uh, this rifle as it is, will it still be a good load once it's been accurized? That'll be an interesting... Mm -hmm. uh, data point to check out. Yeah, the new barrel is going to have probably the same twist and everything, right? I believe so. So then the only thing that might possibly change would be the seating depth. And uh, yeah, and also um, well, I guess the overall fit. The but... overall fit and uh, what is it called? Um, the distance in the bore. Uh, what, what? Headspace. Head, the head spacing might, might change too. I'm not sure what the factory head spacing for uh, Springfield is, but um, I'm sure the guys at Fulton will do a great job. Yeah, sorry folks, we've been out on the range under the desert sun. We got a little bit of sun cooked out there. <laughs> it is rolling into summer, so the temperature is picking up, which is why we're sticking to the shade to record this part. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, I'd say it was a great day. Um, it, was, it, it was really interesting to see how the, even though we uh, had the same seating depth, all the groups would uh, tighten up 
when we got closer to the nodes that had tighter SDs. And um, it could also be uh, uh, maybe human error in it, but uh, the tightest SD didn't necessarily produce the, the tightest group, but it gave us some good information to go off of for next time. And the SD is towards the end there. We're getting in the single digits. There's some around three, right? Yeah, so for the 43.4, the second to last group that you shot and the last group you shot had uh, SDs of under uh, under six, so 3.8 and 5.9. Out of this rifle, that is not bad at all. Mm -hmm. But that also leads me to the reason why I think the harmonics are you know, the biggest factor here. We noticed that the, the groups were really throwing rounds towards one side or towards the other side which made me think that the barrel is kind of swinging around and as long as everything is leaving at a consistent time, the bullets are all being thrown to the same side or maybe slightly mm -hmm. further to the other side. Yeah, we all, the groups did favor to the right for some reason. And yeah, um, nothing was like a cloud with everything perfectly spaced out in the center. It really was heavily weighted, usually three rounds towards one mm -hmm. side. Well, the three, the three groups that we had that showed promise were a little bit more concentrated, but even that had a little bit of about like an inch, inch and a half of a, a horizontal spread. So definitely some work we could do in getting the groups tinier. But uh, yeah. Before we sign off, I should mention that mounted on top here is the M40, the green scope, Mark II with the stainless steel internals, and it is mounted up with our M1A M14 mounting kit which is probably a little difficult to see on camera from here, but I'll try to include some pictures later because this is a thing of beauty. I do very much like shooting it. Yeah, the scope and the, the mounts held solid. Uh, we didn't have any, any drift or any unexpected movement. And uh, yeah, catch us in the next one. Take it easy out there and enjoy whatever it is you're shooting.